recording. All right. And I should have my better camera on. Okay. All right, the American dream overseas. So, so far um, we've started with the future uh, in lecture 11. In week 11, we talked about what are the conditions that you all are going to inherit? What are you gonna face uh, as you move into leadership positions in the world? Um, and that, that is the starting reference point for everything. Then from there, we moved into lecture 10, which was all about the best examples we can come up with for how architecture is having a positive impact on the world. Very, very eye-opening, all the things that we thought were possible. Turns out we were barely scratching the surface. Turns out that design and architecture is not just a passive exercise in fulfilling the wishes and demands of wealthy clients. It turns out that design can do so much more. If you have any questions about that, look at Medellin, Colombia. Look at what is possible uh, for architecture to do, not alone, but as a vehicle, as a catalyst, as a, a, a transformative instrument in the hands of society that takes responsibility for uh, doing the most good for the most people. Medellin, Colombia is the poster, the poster example of the course and of the profession as far as we're concerned. Uh, designing for life is at the core of what the world demands of us moving forward. Moving back from that, um, how do you explain the success of all of these designing for life examples? Uh, well, we have to understand informal settlements. Um, what can design do in the face of the, the worst conditions of hum, human suffering in the world? What are the, and um, in some, what are the hopeful elements of informal settlements that we can build on? Um, gone are the days when we assume that if the housing is a poor quality, we bulldoze it and replace it with something that looks like um, United States suburbia. That friends don't let friends do that. Um, instead, we uh, address the, the root causes of suffering in these uh, neighborhoods for this increasing uh, urban majority of the planet. And so working back from there, uh, last week from informal settlements, it turns out there is a symbiotic relationship between formal and informal uh, economic arrangements between the wealthiest 5% in most of the world's uh, cities and the rest, the urban majority in these cities uh, their suffering is, and the promise of success is uh, directly linked. There are mechanisms of linkage between the wealthiest 5% consumer class and the urban majority um, that occupies a tiny fraction of the urban space and have access to a tiny fraction of the spatial, formal uh, arrangements of the city. And so um, now we move this week into the cultural impact of the United States. In order to understand these relationships between informality and formality, <clears throat> we need to look at uh, the forces of globalization, not just economically, but also culturally. <clears throat> And is there a theory here? Yes, just as we've done for uh, two and a half semesters now, history and theory are always linked. You cannot look at history with, in the absence of a lens to look through. All history is influenced by the lens that we are looking through. Instead of pretending there is no lens, we embrace the fact that 
every view of history is informed by a lens. Instead of the embedded structural uh, power structures of colonialism, extractive capitalism, racism, sexism, all of these uh, forces that distort our view of the world, we acknowledge those distortions by, instead of saying history of architecture, we say history theory of architecture. At the same time, uh, there's gonna be some theoretical uh, observations here. There are some principles that we can look at. Why do we do that? Because principles are entertaining in and of themselves? No, that's the old architectural education where we get distracted and intoxicated on the liquor, the opiate of theory, pure theory disconnected from history and actual reality on the ground. Instead, we, we oscillate between theory and history. We look at actual examples in the world in order to uh, understand, uh, in order to derive the principles that help us look at the rest of the world. And this reading is an example of that. This course is very much the outgrowth of our examination of actual conditions on the ground in Caracas, Venezuela, um, by experience the conditions on the ground, we have an understanding of forces that would otherwise be invisible to us. It turns out those forces are operating everywhere. From, from my own uh, experience, I lived for five years in Indonesia and have visited um, dozens of times. Um, <clears throat> The actual conditions on the ground in Indonesia uh, opened my eyes, forced my eyes open uh, to see certain forces that are operating. And once those forces have been identified, labeled and understood on a theoretical level, you can see them everywhere. In this lecture, you can really understand China so much better if you understand uh, these forces. So. This theory is not disconnected from history. It is actually a lens that helps us see things that would otherwise be invisible. And it turns out these forces are operating right here in the United States, in New England, in Boston. So the first part of this lecture uh, looks at the promise of development. Um, and this, we circle back to, uh, some of the themes that we've looked at previously, specifically the financialization of property and thus the important role of architecture in establishing the financial basis for very powerful economic forces operating uh, in the world and actually having a profound influence on things like your rent payments, uh, how much does it cost to rent uh, a room or uh, a space in an apartment close enough to attend classes at Wentworth? That includes the campus, that includes the dormitories. And how do those forces of real estate markets impact the pressure that we all feel to show up on campus for studio? This is not hypothetical, this is not theoretical. This impacts us every day, um, this, you know, this semester. Why does the Wentworth Institute of Technology insist that we have classes in person in the studio? Here are the forces. This is the lens that we offer to understand why it is we show up in studio, why it is it costs so damn much to live anywhere close to campus. And if your parents' house is anywhere within 50 miles of Boston or any other large city, how is it that my family can afford the insane costs of college, uh, of a college education where other families don't? There's a good chance uh, your parents, like me, uh, the value of the real estate influences our capacity to send our children to college. I have two children attending Smith and uh, WPI. And 
Thank you, real estate market. Thank you, exchange value. Thank you, Burj Khalifa. And what's the role of architecture in all of this? Uh, we looked at this. I'm just, this is just a reminder that the celebrity uh, name brand uh, value of celebrity architects and celebrity architecture has a role to play and plays a very central role in boosting the exchange value of specific buildings and in uh, by direct connection, the real estate value of property uh, in a concentric ring of real estate exchange values out re reaching out from those center points. Every city in the world in the real estate market has what we call the 100% corner. How do you know where the 100% corner is? Well, in the United States, it's where the uh, Rolex watch stores are. There's going to be a Starbucks there for sure. And it's probably where the tallest buildings are. In Japan, it's where the train station is. Um, and it varies from city to city, but uh, it is an interconnected web that it's important for architects to understand. And so that's what we're doing here. Um, we're going to take a look uh, as we move forward. And by we, I mean you. Uh, in the coming months, weeks, uh, weeks, months, and years, keep an eye on One Dalton Place. Um, it will be very interesting, especially in the winter months, to what extent do we see the lights on in the upper floors of One Dalton Place? And what impact does that have on the rent you pay, the cost of a dorm room, the pressure the Institute pushes on you to show up in class? Now that's the financial, financial component of architecture, but we're gonna complicate that. It's already hard enough, right? Who's looking for greater complication? None of us. The world is a complicated place. I didn't sign up for an economics uh, class. Uh, why, are you why are you talking about money? Why are you talking about investment? The only reason we're here talking about finance is because it has a profound impact on architecture. Uh, some would go so far to say it structures everything that we do as architects. There is no architectural design process that is not impacted, influenced, and structured to a certain extent by the operation of these forces of financial value, of investment, uh, capital, and uh, the exchange value of everything that architects do. But now here's the complication. It's not just about exchange value. It's also about the social forces. There's a very tightly intertwined uh, interplay between financial value and social structures. How do we determine who the winners and losers in society are? When we wake up in the morning uh, and we're about to show up uh, for class um, in person or even on Zoom with our cameras on, um, I wear a shirt with a collar and I either iron it or I make sure I'm wearing a sweater so I don't have to iron it. So I'm, I'm being driven by social forces just in the way I dress, uh, in every decision I make, uh, I am uh, operating within a decision space, and so are you. How do we know who the winners and losers are in society, and how do we make sure we end up on the, wrong, the, the right side of that equation? Um, how many of you went, ever went to high school? Only, only a few of you went to high school? Who went to high school? Raise your hand. Okay. So I don't have to explain to you social forces, right? You get it. There are winners and there are losers, and you don't want to end up on the wrong side of that line, right? So, uh, but you're out of high school. That's over, right? Not quite. 
you are entering a world in which uh, the social forces, it's like perpetual high school. Um, we are constantly making choices, personal choices, that will help us end up on the right side of that line, uh, up to and including the choice to go to college. What college to go to? What career path do we take? And then once you're in college, what are your choices there? Are, am I going to make sure I have a, I'm gonna do everything I can to get a high GPA? Um, that's not a bad, uh, bad idea. Um, just because you're in college doesn't mean you're going to end up on the right side of that equation. Uh, 20 years from now, when you are still paying back your student loans, sorry, this is the part where you have a chance to be a little stimulated, agitated, and pay attention to these questions of status. Right? 20 years from now, you, when you are still paying your student loans, uh, the question that you're partner, your life partner, maybe your spouse is going to have for you, um, was that education worth it or not? For some of you, the answer is going to be an emphatic yes. That was the best investment I could have ever possibly made. Look at what has happened uh, as a consequence of that education. But it's not guaranteed. Again, you can't, you know, just because you're in school, it doesn't mean you've got it made. Uh, you, you are responsible for what you do with these opportunities. Don't let your schooling limit what you do in your education. Your education is your business and it's your responsibility and it's your source of power. So um, when my uh, architectural, professional architectural education fell short of what I wanted out of it, I went into construction and I built houses, I did heavy uh, concrete formwork, I welded steel, I sweat copper pipes, and I got to know those things uh, that I felt I needed to be uh, a successful architect, a responsible architect. It wasn't up to the school, the school let, dropped the ball, and as far as I'm concerned, and they let me down and I had to fill in the gaps left by my schooling in order to do my education. And when my history of modern architecture uh, disappointed me, I started reading books about the history of modern architecture. And here we are. Um, so uh, what you do matters. And some of you, hopefully very few of you, hopefully none of you, when your spouse asks you 20 years from now, really, was that worth it? Was that education worth it? Um, some of you are at risk of saying, no, it wasn't worth it. I, that was a mistake. Um, you know, I'm still paying off the student loans and I didn't get what I needed out of it. And hopefully, um, but it's your job to make sure that doesn't happen. We're doing the best we can. Um, but here are the social forces. This is, I, I'm saying this to prepare you for this lecture. There are social forces uh, that are part of all of this. And we know what those social forces are in part because we are hypersensitive to being embarrassed. Um, we are driven by the fear of social embarrassment. And uh, the rules of the game, the rules of social status are embedded in the culture. They're embedded in the social practices uh, of student life and when you graduate of, of professional life. And, but it's not just embedded, it's not only embedded in these social exchanges. The rules, how do we know what the rules are? In part, and now we're going back to the slide, look at this slide. In part, not entirely, but in part, the rules of social status are embedded in the design of the built environment. That is the principle that drives this lecture topic. 
And not just uh, if you're paid attention to the reading, not just in uh, these far flung places, but everywhere. Every human society has uh, a different set of rules that, uh, that are embedded in the built environment, in the architecture, in the uh, infrastructure, in urban form and in the status symbols of a consumer society. And uh, we all are born into this world and we come, we learn what the rules are by paying attention to social practices and to the built environment. In the United States, we know who the winners and losers are, just look at their phones. If we were in person, we might do an exercise where uh, everyone pulls out their phone and then you, you order yourself uh, from high status to low status, um, depending on your phones. Uh, in the 20th century and to a larger extent and increasingly throughout the world, uh, we establish the pecking order of the social status by the car we drive. And if you don't drive a car, uh, you know uh, we know in the United States where to look for the losers. They're waiting for the bus. In Boston, in the city of Boston, we know who the losers are. They're waiting for the bus. They're living in public housing. Uh, we, it's, it's to a large part, uh, the structures of the built environment are informed by the, the structures of social status, but it's not just a passive relationship. The structures of the built environment produce, they have an impact. They actually are productive of these social structures of status. So as young architects, as um, young professionals entering the field uh, responsible for producing the next generation of urban form, it is important to understand how these rules of social status are embedded in the design of the world. So all of us, even if we're not architects, uh, are born into the world. We are both uh, the victims of uh, and the perpetrators. We reproduce these social structures by our behaviors. But as architects, we have special, we have a special role to play because we are the ones uh, more responsible than other people in reproducing these social structures. Okay, you all read the reading, so I'm not going to um, spend a lot of time on these slides. These are a better version of the images that are not so clear in the reading. So Jakarta, Indonesia uh, was colonized by the Dutch for 300 years and it emerged uh, in the wake of World War II as an independent nation state. And we're gonna get into this weird thing that is the nation state that um, it helps to a certain extent to understand how the nation states of the world uh, operate in relation to each other. But then beyond that, it's actually uh, a, a handicap to be stuck talking about nation states. and that's. One of the things we're going to dig into in this lecture. Uh, one of the things that happened in independent Indonesia is the military dictator who was responsible for a anti communist purge that uh, led to the deaths of some, some say a half million people, some say a million people, and the imprisonment of an entire generation. Um, this military dictator uh, successfully softened his image. He took power in 1965 as a military uh, authoritarian figure. Uh, the threat of violence is how he uh, controlled the country. And he softened that image uh, as the smiling general by holding up the promise of development. And by delivering on the promise of development, he uh, coaxed 
the population of Indonesia, the fourth largest country in the world that we've never heard of. Um, he coaxed the population into a version of what we in architecture call modernism and modernization. The term that was used uh, by the smiling general, President Suharto, is development. It's really talking about the same thing, the promise of development. And he delivered successfully uh, to the point where he brought electricity into the rural villages, despite the fact that Indonesia has 15,000 remote islands. Uh, he brought electricity. He put a television in every village. And from that television, he broadcast the national news every night. And the news was controlled by the government uh, so that the, the story that was propagated uh, every night and reinforced every night, it was the story of development. And so lots of ribbon cuttings, lots of infrastructure projects, lots of architecture being built. In the capital of Indonesia, Jakarta, uh, we see a boom in economic activity and explosive growth on a very sensitive landscape. In the 1970s, the Dutch sent a team to support uh, the planning and urban design efforts of the government of Jakarta. And they said, in paradigm A, you see in the upper left, they said, Here's what a lot of countries did. They did. They thought they could do this British model of concentric uh, rings of ring roads and new towns, quote unquote, new towns uh, along those ring roads on the periphery of the country. And the reason the Dutch planners put this forward is because they wanted to very clearly demonstrate the disastrous impacts of urban and suburban sprawl around cities. At this point in the 1970s, we already knew that suburban sprawl was uh, a recipe for economic, environmental, social inequality disaster. And so it was put out there as a negative example, whatever you do, don't do the concentric new town pattern with ring roads. Friends don't let friends. Uh, suggest urban planning patterns uh, based on freeways and suburban sprawl. Don't do that. And instead, they said, let's develop a linear corridor, a lot like uh, the Spanish architect and designer uh, Cerda that we're going to hear about in future weeks uh, when he proposed a linear city, a corridor city. So the Dutch identified Serdar's ideas for Barcelona as really, really important, um, valuable things. Uh, build a rail line and put high uh, density, high rise development around the stations on that rail line. Run it and base it on an east-west corridor model across the northern coast of the island of Java. That's what we should do. Um, and that continued to be put forward in uh, the urban plans of Jakarta decade after decade. Every 10 years, uh, like many cities around the world, we see a new urban plan uh, to guide the development of infrastructure, of new towns. Uh, yes, uh, I'm hinting at how this played out. Every year, the there was a 1970 plan, 1980 plan, 1990 plan, 2000 plan, 2010 plan. Every decade, the same introductory chapter says, don't do a concentric ring road model in suburban real estate development. Just don't do that. Then in chapter two and chapter three, they then proceed to say, hey, everybody, let's build ring roads and suburban new towns and do exactly what we said not to do in chapter one. So the authors of chapter one are not the authors of chapter two. 
And decade after decade, these plans were produced to justify a vast real estate property development that is driven by financial requirements and uh, integrated with the development, uh, the purveyance of this social, cultural set of norms that were produced according to this reading, and um, I have no reason to doubt this author, uh, according to the real estate models that they are copying from Southern California real estate development. So Southern California, Los Angeles, we're gonna get into this next week in the LA school. But by producing, so these architects, they study the history of architecture and they're deploying uh, their understanding of the monuments of history uh, by creating themed real estate enclaves. Here's the French one, Arc de Triomphe. Here's the American one, sometimes spelled with a K. They didn't study it very closely. Here's um, the Duomo in Florence. <clears throat> Remember this by Brunelleschi, 1418. So this is the Italian, the Renaissance. Um, the Italian Renaissance uh, themed uh, new town real estate subdivision. It, the, the term new town is used despite the fact that all it is is a suburban subdivision like the ones we see in Southern California in Irvine Ranch. Um, yes, the, the, the Sphinx. So Egypt, uh, here's a combination of Greece the Acropolis and the Roman Colosseum. Why not? Greece and Rome, why not combine the two? This is the uh, showcase where they uh, display the literature and sell houses. Um, and why not? Issei Shrine, right? Every single monument that we study in the history of architecture, they study in the history of architecture too. Um, they study more or less the same curriculum that we were uh, purveying in the late 20th century, and then it gets directly translated into uh, the real estate development. Here we have Tourism City, Koto Wisata, and um, by simply collaging in Photoshop images from Beverly Hills, 90214, whatever that show is by simply collaging these images from southern california we produce a real estate image that sells houses and properties and the architectural design is the same as the marketing design uh, step one identify the images that uh, the aspiring consumer class of the society want to join and then collage that together in your marketing materials and then put the button on your computer so that your computer will translate those marketing images into three-dimensional uh, form and then just push the print button and you get the architecture that uh, came to occupy a vast territory around the city of Jakarta. And one day I rode my bicycle because that's what I do. I rode my bicycle out to one of these developments uh, just to check it out for myself. And um, there weren't many people around, but there were a few. So I, I found someone and I said, um, what's going on here? Who lives here? And he said, well, I live here. And I said, so how long have you lived here? And it turns out he was hired to be the gardener along with his sisters to take care of the house. Basically, they show up every day. Uh, one person sleeps there, they rotate, just to protect the property from being stripped for the copper pipes uh, and the copper wires. But basically, um, the owners of these houses purchased them as an investment property, the, and then they hired a family to basically uh, garden, keep keep the you know clean it every day, 
keep it clean, keep it maintained, keep it looking good in order to maintain the value of the real estate. And they bought it. Um, the owner of this one house where this uh, friend of mine, my new friend, worked, um, the family had two daughters. And when, their da when each daughter was young, they bought a house in, uh, for each of the two daughters. So they had two houses. And when it comes time for the daughter to get married, they sell the house in order to pay for the wedding and to set up the new family in a comfortable situation somewhere. Um, and in between when the daughter was two and when the daughter gets married, it's simply a property investment. And so if we look back at these maps, it's um, this is a vast area uh, surrounding the, the city of Jakarta. And these yellow and green areas are the new towns, the suburban subdivisions that are filled with these investment properties. They aren't filled with people, except to the extent that there needs to be someone there to occupy the houses. Uh, this is one, this is Lipo Karawachi that we talked about in the reading. And um, it was designed and planned uh, in the infrastructure planning all done by uh, design firms, urban design firms, uh, transportation planning firms located in Southern California. And uh, it's, a, it's a gigantic gated community. And it's interesting because it's one of the few gigantic gated communities that actually included something besides housing. It was actually uh, very different from all the others. It was visionary. Um, one of the interesting things is here are the rural poor who used to have a, a connection across to the, the freeway interchange and the bus system so they could get to jobs in Jakarta. But with the, the purchase of the land, uh, the, really the dispossession of the land, they lost access to uh, that transportation network. They were displaced off the land, and now they have to, it takes a lot longer for them to get to work, to any opportunities. So uh, the imposition of this on the landscape had a huge impact on the surrounding communities. And so these houses are owned, like in Burj Khalifa, uh, like one Dalton is the theory, we'll see. Uh, these properties are owned, but not occupied. And it wasn't enough to have an enormous gated community uh, with a barricade kind of wall system that we're going to see as we go back in time. Medieval cities of Europe had fortifications to protect them um, from invaders. This has a similar surrounding wall, but just in case those walls are breached, we need to put walls. The, the designers from Southern California are not used to putting walls internally in the gated community, but the, res the purchasers of these houses insisted that there be fortifications built between each of these enclaves so that if the outer walls ever were breached, they would be protected uh, in their enclave, their residential enclave within the larger fortifications. Sure enough, 1998, uh, with the uh, econo Asian economic crisis, the collapse of the uh, money system of multiple countries in Southeast Asia, uh, the economy collapsed, riots occurred, the ethnically Chinese populations that are largely the investors uh, owning these properties were specifically targeted in a racist rampage, uh, burned, their houses were burned, the uh, residents were raped and murdered in large numbers. It turns out they were right. These uh, fortifications were very important. Uh, in, the, uh, in the aftermath of the fall of the Suharto authoritarian regime, uh, things carry on more or less uninterrupted. That's how capitalism works. It is the most flexible, adaptive, reflexive system 
economic system and human history. And so under the new democratic leadership of Indonesia, things proceed. This is Lipo Karawachi. This is the vision. And um, this is very much a direct quote from Los Angeles, California, that we're going to see moving forward uh, for the next two weeks. We are looking at the United States because we need to understand how the rest of the world came to uh, enthusiastically embrace the design paradigms of Los Angeles. And this is a diagram that we will be unpacking a bit more next week. Uh, on the left, we see the former situation where downtown uh, cores, and this, maybe you can think of this as the Chicago uh, model, where there's a downtown core of office towers, shopping malls, restaurants, hotels, business, there's a business uh, core, a business center at the core of the city. And around that, there are residential uh, neighborhoods that move out in concentric rings of decreasing density. That's the classic model of urban formation. Think of New York, think of Chicago, and then go overseas, Paris, London, uh, Berlin, Etc. This is the classic 19th and 20th century uh, paradigm of urban, it's the pattern of urban development where uh, the values move from the highest value at the center and it moves out in concentric rings out. On the right, we see the Los Angeles pattern where um, Los Angeles was just one town in a, in a, in a vast basin of many, many different towns. And as Los Angeles uh, grew economically and all these suburbs that sprawled out from across the valley of Southern California, uh, these towns became more and more intertwined economically and through commuting and through the use of the automobile. Each town struggled to assert its own uh, economic dominance. And so instead of a single core, you have a, a polynuclear, uh, many, many different centers. And so if you look at Los Angeles, you see many, many different centers. Some of them are quite successful, Santa Monica, uh, West LA, Hollywood, and some of them are uh, economically uh, the equivalent of uh, the informal settlements, uh, think South Central. And race is at the very heart of all of this. So brace yourself for the next few weeks. We're gonna start to unpack some of these things uh, so that we can understand them, so that we are not blind to these structures and how they don't just influence the form of cities, they are reproduced by the design of cities and its architecture. And so uh, we're gonna take a look right here at the central core surrounded by what I'm highly, as much as this is a useful diagram to, to look at the former paradigm, the pre-LA school paradigm on the left in contrast with the LA school paradigm on the right, uh, as, as useful as this diagram is, it's flawed fundamentally. And it's this use of the label public space. This is not public space. This is what Rem Kohlhaas, uh, the Dutch architect who I hesitate to, you all know who Rem Kohlhaas is, right? Raise your hand, Rem Kohlhaas, I know who that is. Yes, okay, um, not so sure anymore. Um, Ram Kohlhaas coined a term brilliantly, as this is what he does. Um, he calls it junk space. Junk space is what it is. And here on the lower right, in the pink rectangle, we're looking at a bizarrely, dramatically clear uh, demonstration of this edge. 
this hardened boundary like a fortress wall that we will see in the medieval fortifications of the cities of Europe as we go back in time. Basically, this is kind of what that looks like. Um, but it's it's a similar form generated by entirely different forces. It is defensive. Uh, it is a defensive boundary produced by the architecture of walls and object buildings, towers in the park, which we will also be talking about in future weeks. Um, and the carving out of space for architects to do what we do. This is the edge of Jakarta. On one side of the wall is the radiant city, the radiant garden city, beautiful, that we'll, we will be talking about three weeks from now. Uh, and on the other side of the wall is the junk space. It is the informal settlements that are where a vast majority of the population lives. And so the 5% uh, of the, the, the wealthiest 5% of uh, the, the population, the urban population, makes use of the space to the right, and the rest uh, have a tiny fraction of that space left over on the left. Now, don't be fooled. The people who work in the office towers on the right live in the kampung of the left. So there is a symbiotic, we're back to this, symbiotic relationship between these two worlds. Here's the architecture of the wall. This is very much uh, what architects produce in the design of these, uh, these suburban subdivisions. The wall itself is a crucial instrument of producing the architecture of the, the subdivision. Back in the inner city, we see the super blocks, the towers in the super blocks that gradually carve out uh, the space of uh, the informal settlements of the Kampong. And they aren't quite informal settlements because they have quite secure um, land rights. So they don't quite meet the criteria for being determined to be informal settlements. And yet, uh, they are displaced in vast numbers every year as the, the real estate development, the property development forces, the machinery of property development driven by financial investment, exchange value, not so much, uh, it's not that we need these condominium towers, uh, it's that we can make money selling these condominium towers. Uh, and we just, count on the fact that as the second largest city in the world, um, there will be demand at some point. So the use value is not uh, materially relevant to the decision to develop this land, and it's not materially development to the design of these buildings. Uh, it's driven first and foremost by exchange value. So design the units, design the buildings, design the landscapes, design the infrastructures uh, that will sell. Is it only in Jakarta where this happens? No, it happens all over the world, but it doesn't happen here in the United States, does it? Well, um, I keep that question in mind as we move forward. And so we see this very sharp distinction between high-rise towers and what's left over. And here's the marketing image produced in Southern California by the designers of the largest suburban subdivision development in the United States, Irvine Ranch in Orange County, California. Uh, they designed it and they sent it to Jakarta. Um, I interviewed the, the designers, I, I visited them in Irvine Ranch, and they said, funny thing, we said, well, we have to come see the site. We have, to, we have to do our site analysis. We have to study the social forces. We have to study the economic forces of the market. We can't design this uh, without visiting Jakarta. 
And the client said, no, 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 no. You stay right where you are. Just pretend that you are designing it for Irvine Ranch, Orange County, Southern California, and uh, just send it over. And that was very disturbing to these architects, designers, and planners, but they did it anyway because that's how they keep their firm afloat. They never visited uh, Jakarta. They never visited Indonesia. They never visited the site. They designed it as if it was Orange County and they sent it over. And now there's actually, um, long after uh, this publication uh, went to press, uh, the title of the chapter is Orange County Java. Guess what the real estate market did in uh, Jakarta? They designed and have now built uh, a subdivision. And guess what it's called? It's called Orange County. So there is now an Orange County Java. So what's up with that? Um, so by engaging this facts on the ground reality of Jakarta, Indonesia, and asking the question, how did this happen? What are the forces driving this architecture, this urban form, this deployment of infrastructure? What the hell is going on here? It produced an understanding of these forces that help us understand what's happening all over the place. <clears throat> is Jakarta the only place in the world where we have a rising, successful, five percent wealthiest five percent of uh, the consumer class emerging as the drivers of uh, consumer culture and financial uh, investment uh, and the design and construction of the built environment. Um, it's connected to this question, is there a third world? So is there a third world? Um, thumbs up, yes, there is a third world. Thumbs down. No, there's no third world anymore. And thumb to the side, well, I, I don't know, or I think kind of. Thumbs up, yes, there's a third world. Thumbs down, no. Or somewhere in between. I see you. Where are your thumbs? Don't make me call out names. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm seeing lots of sideways. I'm seeing I'm seeing a good healthy mix. Um, and if your camera's off, you can use that orange thing. Now let's do okay. One, two, three. Everybody, put their thumbs. There's no sideways thumb on the um, reactions. So I want to see all the thumbs. I'm going to take a screenshot for thumbs. Here comes the screenshot for thumbs. Wait, hold it. I gotta go to the next one. Screenshot for thumbs and. Thank you. Okay. Lots of thumbs up. Okay. So let's look at this question. Is there a third world? So when we when we look at this and we look at the whole world, uh, it's useful, but it's only useful to a point. Uh, it cloaks a lot of things. For example, uh, it's useful to understand that around the time of World War II, what was the human population? Eh, let's call it two billion, more or less. Somewhere between two and two and a half billion, right? We're all friends here. Let's call it 2.2 .2 billion, okay? So in the developed world, uh, in the first and second world, what's the first world? First world are the capitalist nations that allied together uh, to fight, um, well, it's, it's just capitalism. The capitalist nations are the first world. The second world are the socialist nations, mainly the Soviet Union, we call it Russia now, and we call it Eastern and Central Europe now, uh, and China. So the first world, um, Western Europe, North America, capitalism. The second world, Soviet Union, China, Cuba, socialism. The third world, 
are all the countries that were colonized by the first and second world nations. They were colonial holdings that in a burst of um, something de uh, ended formal colonialism and gained formal independence and became the independent nation states of Africa, bizarrely chopping up the continent into 44 or 53, I can't remember, 44 separate nation states, uh, and Asia bizarrely separating uh, Bangladesh, um, Pakistan from India, and one of the most violent uh, episodes of human history um, that continues to play out today. So, et cetera. Um, so there, that was the third world. And they were proudly uh, attempting, led by uh, the first president of Indonesia in a meeting in Java, uh, a few hours away from Jakarta, in the Bandung conference, uh, was the birth of the non-aligned movement. They said, we commit to each other, Egypt, India, Indonesia, we commit to each other to not align ourselves with either the first world or the second world. We are not going to allow ourselves to be the puppets of uh, these superpowers. We insist that we uh, follow our own path, uh, separate and lead. We are the hope of the vast humanity of the world. So uh, the developed West was about uh, a little less than 1 billion people. And the third world was about 1.1 billion, a little more than a billion, right? So what happened? The developed West, what is, what is hidden in this graph, in this slide, is that the developed West, uh, the population pretty much flattened out uh, for various reasons, the demographic pressures, uh, education for women and girls, uh, the, the population growth in the developed countries flattened out, and it was the third world countries uh, where population exploded, leading to this distribution of population increasingly concentrated in cities. The largest cities in the world have for a long time been in what used to be called the third world. And uh, those are continue to be the fastest growing cities in the world, while the cities of Western Europe are facing population declines. Italy is in economic crisis because their population is dropping. Japan is in economic crisis because of a population tank. The only reason the United States is growing in population is through immigration. Whew, saved by immigration. Let's look at this. Here I put life expectancy at birth from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we stopped the world. And this is all UN statistic that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China, they're moving up against better health. They're improving there. All the green Latin American countries they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families, but they no longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here. They still remain here. This is India. Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh. It's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. Well, that's the Super Bowl. This is the real Super Bowl. China is the Tom Brady 
of the world. Let me make a comparison directly between United States of America and Vietnam, 1964. America had small families and long life. Vietnam had large families and short lives. And this is what happens. The data during the war indicate that even with all the death, there was an improvement of life expectancy. By the end of the year, the family planning started in Vietnam and they went for smaller families. And the United States up there is getting for longer life, keeping family size. And in the 80s now, they give up communist planning and they go for market economy and it moves faster even than social life. And today we have in Vietnam the same life expectancy and the same family size here in Vietnam, 19, 2003, as in the United States, 1974, by the end of the war. I think we all, if we don't look in the data, we underestimate the tremendous change in Asia, which was in social change before we saw the economical change. So this is Hans Rosling, our hero. He took the radical step of compiling all of the, just like we did with the United Nations population statistics, going back to 10,000 uh, BC. Uh, and we put it together in that slide that we've been looking at of the global population wall, the demographic explosion. Hans Rosling is doing the same thing with every other statistic, child uh, mortality rates, uh, and he's making it available to us. He's, he's modeling what we should all be doing in the 21st century. We don't just keep these things uh, hidden under the hood. We put it out into the public domain. We make these tools. He's using a tool uh, that he created called Gapminder. And he's convinced governments around the world in the United Nations to make these statistics available, freely available on the internet. And instead of locking it away in spreadsheets that make no sense to anybody, he is using design uh, strategies to create meaning. This is a vivid demonstration of the power of information design, where the the design of the presentation of the information is as or more powerful than the information itself. This is a, an architecture move. The design of these things is as important as or more important than the core content itself. This is what design, the power of design. So, um, so what you see here is an argument that Hans Rosling is making is that the third world uh, is no longer a thing, that the third world has become something uh, that has dissolved because of the tremendous power of economic development since the early 1960s up through the 2000s. Um, here's the thing though. Just as the, um, the global population is a, useful, uh, is a useful representation up to a point, but it cloaks as much as it reveals. It cloaks the different uh, population growth that I presented between the developed world and the developing world, which after the third world kind of dissolved, we stopped calling it the third world because that's kind of, it became kind of an insult. Uh, and we started calling it the developed world versus the developing world. And we um, associated it with nation states, which is what Hans Rosling is doing. But um, the, the, if you stop at the nation state, you're kind of missing the point. You have to move to cities. And you have to look at the distinction between populations and the life chances of populations within the cities. Because one of the arguments that Hans Rosling makes is when you look at the nation states, um, we've, we've successfully uh, gotten rid of poverty. We don't have winners and losers. There's no sharp line between winners and losers is the punchline of Hans Rosling's uh, 
uh, presentations, but he can only assert that as long as he keeps the data aggregated in nation state bubbles of population. As soon as he splits it apart, now he has to admit that there are winners and losers and he has to admit, I've, I've deleted the part because it just, I, it feels irresponsible to expose you to this, where he says, uh, we've, we've gotten rid of the division between winners and losers. Um, what he means when he says that is uh, if you look at the nation states, but the nation states are not, again, it's not good enough. We have to look at the cities and that's not good enough. We have to look at the inequality of the different segments within the cities. And uh, that's where we start to figure things out. So remember that income inequality video that was so disturbing when we looked at it? It was the income inequality video uh, about the United States. Let's do that for, um, let's do that for, um, if we can, for the world. People are talking a lot about inequality these days about the fact that the richest 1% have so much more than everybody else. But most of the focus seems to be on the United States. And it strikes me that the same story needs to be told about global inequality too. So I did some research, and this is what I found from reliable sources like the UN. It turns out that while the US is totally out of whack, things are actually way worse for the planet as a whole. Let's start with this graph. A perfectly even distribution of wealth among all living people with everyone divided into five equal groups. Now, let's show how much each group actually has. Shocking, right? 80% of the world's people barely have any wealth. It's hard to even see them on the chart. Meanwhile, the richest 2%, they have more wealth than half of the rest of the world. Let's look at this chart another way. Let's take the whole world's population, all 7 billion of us, and reduce it to just a representative 100 individuals. Here they are, poorest people on the left, richest people on the right. Now let's show how the world's total wealth, roughly $223 trillion, is distributed. The vast majority have practically nothing, nothing with which to educate their children, nothing with which to pay for basic medicines. Well, the richest 1%, they've accumulated 43% of our world's wealth. The bottom 80%, meanwhile, and that's eight out of every 10 people, have just 6% between them. But even this doesn't really show how extreme things have become. The richest 300 people on earth have the same wealth as the poorest 3 billion. So the number of people it takes to fill a mid-sized commercial aircraft have more wealth than the populations of India, China, the U.S. and Brazil combines. We can also see this difference geographically, with a huge and growing gap between a few rich places versus the majority of the world. For most of history, things were much more equal. 200 years ago, rich countries were only three times richer than poor countries. By the end of colonialism in the 1960s, they were 35 times richer. Today, they're about 80 times richer. Rich countries try to compensate for this by giving aid to poor countries, about $130 billion each year. That's a lot of money. So then why does the wealth gap keep getting bigger? One reason I found is that large corporations are taking more than $900 billion out of poor countries each year through a form of tax avoidance called trade mispricing. So what does Hans Rosling have to say about the income distribution within countries? Let's check it out. Let's find a way to access. Yeah. Okay. Let's, sorry about that. If you look at if you look at the average data of the countries, 
they are like this. Now, that's dangerous to use average data because there's such a lot of difference within countries. So if I go and look here, we can see that Uganda, that today is where South Korea was 1960. If I split Uganda, there's quite a difference within Uganda. These are the quintiles of Uganda. The richest 20% of Ugandans are there. The poorest are down there. If I split South Africa, it's like this. And if I go down and look at Niger, where there was such a terrible famine lastly, it's like this. The 20% poorest of Niger is out here, and the 20% richest of South Africa is there. And yet, we tend to discuss on what solutions there should be in Africa. Everything in this world exists in Africa. And you can't discuss universal access to HIV for that quintile up here with the same strategy as down here. The improvement of the world must be highly contextualized. And it's not relevant to have it on regional level. We must be much more detailed. Okay. Thank you, Hans. Um, and so it, it turns out that the third world uh, didn't so much go away uh, as it dissolved and broke up and exists now in the urban majority of every city in the world. So even here in the United States, the poorest uh, majority of the population in cities has gotten relatively poorer uh, relative to the wealthiest 5%. Uh, uh, or here we're looking at the top quintile, which is the wealthiest 20%. So even here, it is cloaking the reality in which uh, even in the wealthiest 20%, uh, of which historically our profession has occupied that wealthiest 20% um, from for most of US history, and we may still occupy that uh, in the future. Uh, but even this level of detail obscures the reality of the distribution within the richest 20%. So uh, it's a challenge um, to understand what these, uh, what happened to the third world, where is it now? Uh, you can't see the reality by looking at global population, check. You cannot see the reality by looking at nation states, check. You start to get a hint when you look at the five quintile distributions within nation states, uh, you get an even better hint when you start to look at cities, city by city. And, but still, what you really have to do is drill down into the reality of whatever city it is you're looking at. And guess what? It's not just architects and planners and urban designers that are doing this. The social sciences generally have become architecturalized. There is something called the spatial turn in the social sciences. Using tools like ArcGIS, um, the collection of fine-grained statistics, because of the computer revolution, we now have spatial organizational data that economic historians are using, uh, social historians are using. Uh, there is a new uh, spatialization of the social sciences. Everyone is an architect now, it seems. Uh, when, when I show up at the uh, Association of American Geographers uh, meetings, uh, I find out that uh, almost no one at these meetings studied geography in college. They are economists, they are historians, they are sociologists, they are anthropologists. They, uh, some of them are architects and planners, uh, but uh, this geography conference is a massive party of 3,000 people getting together to see how we can understand the world uh, through a spatial lens. And uh, when you identify yourself as an architect, they light up and they 
crowd around you because you have the tools. You have these design tools. You uh, hopefully you will all be exposed to ArcGIS. These are the tools that everybody wants from us. They want access to how we spatialize these phenomena through the power of architectural methods of representation. China, armed with these lenses and these understandings, what's the deal with China? Specifically, what's the deal with Shanghai? Um, Mao Zedong, you've probably heard of him. Um, who, who's responsible for more death in the world, Stalin or Mao? I can't remember. Um, I think it's Mao though. Um, by controlling the price of rice uh, from a top-down economic point of view, it led to massive starvation, somewhere between 20 and 30 million people. Did it show up on the population chart? No. The human population is so large that even the loss of 20 to 30 million souls doesn't really register on that larger chart. It's cloaked because of the aggregation of data. So Mao died uh, and uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, embraced uh, market economics with uh, socialist characteristics. And he inaugurated the open door policy. And instead of forcing the removal of population from cities because they are anti-communist, he said, come on back to cities, we need to show up on the global stage as a world player. We, China, used to be the global superpower, unrivaled for centuries and centuries, only to be humiliated in the opium wars of 1840, uh, to be humiliated in the colonial oppression of the international, uh, the international economic forces that divided up Shanghai into the concessions and basically without ever formally colonizing China, it imposed an economic order on its port cities that was the economic equivalent of colonialization. This profound humiliation of the 19th century will not go unaddressed. If you wanna understand what China is all about, you need to understand the historical forces driving China. China is not going to let the humiliation at the hands of the European uh, superpowers during the colonial uh, era of the 19th century go unaddressed. And so it is uh, aggressively using the tools of capitalism and capitalist development in the context of communism uh, state socialism to beat the capitalist nation states at their own game. Um, they're not quite spiking the ball in the end zone yet, but man, look at what they do architecturally to become a player, to establish China as a global superpower and uh, partially by establishing Shanghai as one of the key economic uh, global capital cities of the world. So uh, if you want to put your nation state on the map, who are you gonna call? You call the architects. So uh, Deng Xiaoping takes over, he meets with the mayor of Shanghai, the governor of Shanghai, he says, listen, we want to make Shanghai the next global capital. It needs to compete with London, uh, New York, and Tokyo. And so let's have a competition to make, to finally cross over the Huangpo River in Shanghai and transform those rice fields into a new global superpower capital of, uh, of trade. And so um, they finally, after dreaming about it for about a century, they finally cross over with bridges and tunnels, money tunnels and subways, and they develop almost out from scratch, starting in the 1980s, this new capital city of capitalism. It's not the capital of the government, 
It's the capital of international trade. And they have a competition. And what do you do? It's just like it, it's like the suburban subdivisions of Jakarta, but on steroids. They basically um, take architects like you who have studied architectural history and the history of cities, and they do a copy paste as if it's Photoshop. They say, well, how about Manhattan? And so they say, yeah. Um, so they photocopy Manhattan and they paste it on Pudong. How about Venice? Why not? It's easy to do. They photocopy Venice and at the proper scale, they paste it on Pudong. How about Paris? Paste. And they have an international competition. Uh, all the, the superstar architects of the world um, mobilize their forces. They come up with all of these proposals. And surprise, surprise, the Chinese team wins the competition. And so they get the task of uh, taking it further from just raw ideas. They develop it into an actual urban design plan, including all of the architecture. And the, what they do is they take the ideas from um, uh, Norman Foster, uh, the French superstars, uh, they take all these teams and their submissions and they collage them together into a best of uh, superstar album that is the planning design for Pudong uh, revealed in 1993 in this model. And then it gets built. At one point, one sixth of the world's cranes are all uh, in Pudong, building um, many of the tallest buildings in the world. Um, still to this day, five or six of the tallest buildings in the world are in Pudong, Shanghai. <clears throat> but what do you do? No one wants to uh, lease space in Pudong because there's a glut on the market. They didn't build uh, Pudong because there was high demand for office space or residential space. They did it as a symbolic gesture to put Shanghai in this China on the map. So they had all of this unnecessary real estate. So what do you do? Here's what you do. You say to Amazon and to Apple and to every company that wants access to Chinese markets, uh, they say, we open. We gladly open our arms to your trade agreements. Uh, please, we want to part with, partner with you and have open trade. We want to give you access to uh, the consumer class consumers of China, the 5% wealthiest. But because China is 1.4 trillion and climbing, 5% uh, of 1.4 trillion is, uh, if you just, if, the 95% poorest uh, population of China just didn't even show up on your radar economically as consumers, which is the reality. 5% of 1.4 trillion, I don't know who does math. Um, that's a lot. That's 70 million people, right? That's a lot. 700, it's a lot. 70. That's a big country even if it's only populated by the wealthiest 5%. So we want access to Chinese markets. We can get access as long as we lease uh, 600 square meters of office space in Pudong. We don't need that office space, but we're gladly going to lease that office space, even if we never occupy it. So there is... It's not, in this case, it's not the exchange value that's driving the, the architecture boom. It's uh, the drive to put China on the map through urban design. And they put it on stamps. Uh, they make it part of the image construction of the country. The skyline is the way to place yourself on the world stage to join, you know, again, all the world is high school. In order to be one of the cool kids, one of the jocks, you got to hire the architects to build the towers. And um, here's, and then in a 
supercharged version of what we saw in Jakarta, uh, you create thematic uh, real estate subdivisions. Here's Thamestown modeled after London, uh, some medieval London thing. And they build it along with several hundred other similarly themed towns. And people buy the real estate. All of this real estate is purchased. No one lives there. But it's a very popular location to have your wedding photograph taken. Instead of flying off to London to do your photo shoot for your wedding, if you are in the consumer class, just go to Thamestown outside of Shanghai. Uh-oh. First, you must ask yourself, are you wealthy? The simple truth of the world is that most games for someone to win. So, someone has to lose. Mm -hmm. It's a fairy tale that actually happened. There's confusion over who has to pay. So they drowned you and 20 other innocent people. And somebody's making money from it. It all goes back to this law firm, Bosak Fonseca. <clears throat> so what happens next? What do we do next? <laughs> Try and send money. It's a scam that goes from Houston to the West Indies to some bank who knows where. They're getting away with murder. Which is bad. Bad? Yeah, bad is such a big word for being such a small man. I'm on a big fight. Gonna out on the town. It's a fight. How does it all work? Bribery, corruption, money laundering, millions and millions and millions of dollars. Somebody has to sound the alarm. Oh, shit. Oh, Where the fuck is my money? Most of the time, we don't even know. So it's something you can watch. Um, it's called The Laundromat. It's about money laundering and how it drives uh, things like uh, urban form and architecture, uh, among other things. Um, All-star cast, highly entertaining. It leads to more questions than answers. But if you want to understand why cities and why architecture plays, why cities look the way they look, and what is the role of architecture? What is the role of our profession? What is your role in the uh, careers that you are about to enter? Um, this is the start of the journey to find those answers. In the meantime, we look at the outcomes of what is occurring in Shanghai and cities throughout the world, including Boston. Um, right down the street from me, there's a, one of the most expensive houses in Cambridge and no one lives in it. It's probably worth $20 million. No one lives in it. They picked up the old house, moved it to one part of the site. They built, I told you this, I think, they built a five-story underground bunker, um, then moved the house back on it, and then moved the house again because they did some design changes. They don't care how much money goes into this house. No one lives in it. Here's the people who bought into the, the ghost cities of China. They bought refrigerators, they bought washing machines, they bought um, appliances, and now they cannot afford to pay the monthly electrical bill. So they use this local drainage canal to do their laundry. They use this local drainage canal uh, to fish and get food. Um, and the ghost city phenomena of China is uh, a terrifying thing where all of this architecture, and this is a combination of China needing to place itself on the global stage, but also the financial miracle that is China. The financial miracle of China is to a large extent, we think of, we think of the financial uh, miracle of China is being driven by manufacturing because of the high quality, uh, superb educational qualifications, 
high quality of its labor force uh, and the dependability of its manufacturing at extremely low cost. We think of that as the thing that is behind the miracle of China, and it is, but that's not all. Like in Indonesia, what we see in China is we see land that has zero market value because it's a socialist economy. And when this transfer from a socialist economy to a capitalist economy, step one is you create value associated with land. And as soon as you do that, you can now put that land on the market and watch the value of that land uh, balloon. And that's what province after province, city after city in China, with the, uh, the encouragement of the central uh, state. And so the construction boom is uh, a political imperative driven by political forces. If you wanna keep your job as governor of the province, if you wanna keep your job as mayor of the city or whatever role you play in the hierarchy, you have to mobilize capital in the construction of these cities, even if nobody ever lives in these cities. So these are the ghost cities, the ghost malls of China. Slowly people are starting to move in, but uh, it is a bizarre distortion of what it is we assume to be the case uh, in the profession of architecture that we produce buildings and landscapes in order to serve the, the populations that need these things, not necessarily. And so the final question is what can design do? If this is the situation, what are we supposed to do? Uh, well, the answers to that are uh, already being done in your studio. You, the world population is expected to reach. So let me just preface this by, uh, if you think sustainability is important uh, for your studio project, what this message is, it's not just about the building you design in studio. It's not just about the one building you design when you graduate and you get a great job and pay off those student loans. It's about the impact, the cultural impact that in the brief few moments that remain of United States cultural dominance globally, for better or worse, despite the last president, uh, the world still looks at the United States as a model for the future. The world looks at the United States and sees, reads itself into that model of American dream. And so it's not just about the building that you produce in studio and when you graduate, it's about the transformation of the American dream. What if the cultural image that gets broadcast daily through the movie industry, the advertising industry, through the music industry, uh, what if the cultural package emanating out of the United States is one of zero carbon. Is one, in order to be a winner in this world, you have to have a zero carbon footprint. That's where the cultural power of the United States lies. That's where the cultural power, uh, the real power of design, the design professions to transform the world lies in the model of the American dream produced by you when you graduate and you produce a new paradigm, a new world through the architecture and urban form, it's going to get transmitted around the world. And that's what matters. Here's why. It's not about the population. It's about the impact per person. World population is expected to reach about 9 billion by... Oops. 11 billion by 2100. World population is expected to reach about 9 billion by 2050.
86% of this, in other words, almost 8 billion people, will be in the developing world. The thing is, the actual number of people is not in itself an issue, except in some very densely settled countries. In fact, you could fit the entire population of the world into the state of Texas, although not very comfortably. In world population terms, what really matters is a simple ratio, 32 to 1. It represents consumption. This is where our problems begin. The average rates at which we consume resources, such as oil and metals, and produce waste, like plastic and greenhouse gases, are about 32 times higher in North America, Western Europe, Japan and Australia than they are in the developing world. 32 to 1 captures the difference in consumption between the first world and the third world. This little ratio has huge consequences. Let me explain. The estimated 1 billion people who live in the developed world have a relative per capita consumption rate of 32. Most of the world's other 5.5 billion people in the developing world have a rate well below 32, mostly near to 1. This means that with 10 times the population, the United States consumes 320 times more resources than, for example, Kenya does. The poor of the world logically want to have our standards of living. But the fact is that the planet simply does not have sufficient resources to support such a dream. And so, we're left with a fundamental problem. If the whole developing world were to catch up with us, world consumption rates would increase 11 fold. It would be as if the world had a population of 72 billion people. We may see China's growing consumption as a problem, but the Chinese and many, many others are only reaching for the consumption rate we already have. Telling them they cannot or should not try would be hypocritical, immoral, self-serving, and futile as it wouldn't work. What we should be trying to do is to make consumption rates and living standards more equal around the world and to do it at a level the planet can sustain. The question is, how can we do this? Architecture. So it's important to uh, take all the lessons we have available to us, embrace them, learn from them, and uh, build on top of them to build an architecture that is capable of displacing this type of architecture with this type of architecture. And uh, even you know, sometimes the most important messages, uh, the most important lessons, the most important examples of good architecture, defining good as being bringing the greatest benefits available to the most people. If that becomes our definition of good, some of those examples are coming from the United States already, but. Some of them are coming from other places like Medellin, Colombia. And so it's important that uh, we get those lessons as aggressively as we can. Don't count on us to show you these lessons. You have to go get them yourself. Uh, you have to find those lessons, um, in, embrace them, build on those lessons, produce architecture, that can uh, be embraced by others, uh, your colleagues who are studying architecture and urban design and planning and everything else all around the world, make these examples uh, foremost in the minds of people. When they look at the United States, uh, they see the future and the future looks like this, not like, let's see. I'm not sure where that slide is. I had another slide. Um, not like this. So that is, there's a few more decades in which the United States might possibly continue to exert a powerful cultural influence like the one uh, implied in the reading and in the look at Jakarta and, Ch and Shanghai. And in these last few moments of cultural influence, the design community of the United States coming out of Wentworth and other schools like Wentworth have a remarkable opportunity to present to the world a model of design practice 
that can catalyze a significant and meaningful change in the impacts of the world. Now, what do we do? So if you have any questions about anything, uh, please hang after class. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much. Good luck with your analysis uh, work for Wednesday, and we will see you then. Happy President's Day weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Manuel, you're muted. I know. I unfortunately have to leave now. I call you later in the afternoon. Okay. Talk. I have to leave. I have to. I have to leave my house now. Um, okay. Okay. All See right. you later. Thank. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very. That's very. Thank you. Any questions out there?